Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us here at the Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Stacy, and I'm coming, coming to you from the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. Now this episode of our Aquarium Online Academy is all about otters and how we can help otters out in their natural habitat as well. If you have any questions or any thoughts that you want to share, we would love to hear from you. We actually have a text line right here. It's 562-286-286. 1838. And if you text us, uh, my friend Amanda, who is a uh, man in the computer that has all of the text coming to it, will send that uh, message over to me and I can say it here on our program. And uh, if you are watching this after the fact, if it's not live for you, that's okay. You can still send us questions. We have an email address that you can send emails to, and that is live, L I V E, at lbaop.org. Again, that's live at lbaop.org. All right, so we said that we're going to be talking about sea otters for this episode. How many of you like sea otters? They are a pretty charismatic animal. Just look at that little face. <laughs> All right, so sea otters are pretty charismatic. They're very busy, so they tend to move quite a lot. They do rust a lot too, um, and their behaviors tend to be pretty adorable. And I think that's probably why they're one of the most loved animals in the ocean. But they also play a really, really important role in the oceans as well. So that's what we're going to be focusing on. Not just the cuteness, but also their role in the ocean. Now, sea otters are the smallest marine mammals. Marine mammals are mammals that live in the ocean. Now, you may be thinking of a lot of mammals that live on land. I think most of us, when we think of examples of mammals, we think of land ones. Uh, marine mammals include the sea otters, dolphins, uh, other whales. So those are marine mammals. What are some of the things that they all have in common? All right. Well, first of all, just looking at this one right here, they definitely have hair or fur at some point in their lifetime. Otters are incredibly furry, and that fur is a really important part of their life in their ocean habitat. We'll talk more in detail about that uh, in just a few moments. Another thing that you'll, uh, you may know about them because they are mammals is that they breathe air. Now, what does that mean when you live in the ocean? Just think about that for a moment. If you live and swim in the ocean, which is water, but you breathe air, that presents a few challenges, okay? One of the challenges is, where would your food come from? Well, their food comes from the ocean, right? It comes from actually deeper in the ocean on the ocean floor. Now they do live in shallower areas and that's because they can't hold their breath for a ton of time. In fact, I think otters, uh, sea otters have been clocked holding their breath for about five minutes, but that's really, really rare. That's like maximum amount of time. Typically it's anywhere from maybe one to four minutes or so is much more typical. So they actually have to hold their breath, dive under the water, gather up the food that they want, and then float at the top to feed. And that's what we see right here. This otter has a pretty tasty little treat um, and it's floating on its back so it's easy to breathe and it even has like a little table, if you notice here. Its body is almost like a little dinner table, which works out really, really well for them. Okay, so we know that they're furry. We know that they have to hold their breath when they're underwater because they breathe air. Another mammal characteristic? Well, they are warm-blooded. Warm-blooded means that their body temperature, their internal body temperature, has to stay constant and fairly warm. If it doesn't stay constant, then they could get very, very sick. Um, it's a really bad thing for them to get a fever or for their body temperature to drop too low as well. So that is a challenge also in the water environment where they live. Now, the southern sea otter, which is what we have here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, the southern sea otter... Uh, lives in central California. So really from like Santa Barbara up through uh, just south of San Francisco, let's say. Um, so that's really where you're going to find the southern sea otter. And that's warmer than the northern sea otter. Northern sea otters are further north. 
um, and they can be found from Oregon all the way up through Alaska. And then if you cross the Pacific Ocean onto the other side um, and you drop into like Russia and Japan, there is another subspecies of sea otter there as well. So there are three subspecies of sea otters. They all have a whole lot in common, but there is some variation, which is why they're considered subspecies. So the ones we're really going to focus on today are the southern sea otters because the southern sea otters are the ones that I think um, Californians in general are most familiar with, but we are definitely most familiar with them here at the Aquarium of the Pacific because those are the ones that we have here. Okay, so we know that they need to stay warm in cool waters. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that because that kind of ties in with the hair and fur. Okay, so they have hair fur at some point in their life, they breathe air, they are warm-blooded, they do give live birth in the water, and they also have to nurse their babies in the water. Those are the last two mammal characteristics, right, that all mammals, almost all mammals, have in common is live birth and nursing young. So it can be quite challenging for a mama otter to um, have a baby and live in the ocean at the same time. Well, thankfully, the habitat they live in works really well for them. They are, they're basically matched to their habitat very well with a ton of different adaptations that helps them survive there. So what is their habitat? Well, most southern sea otters that you see are going to live in kelp forests. And kelp forests are these really amazing habitats. We actually saw the aquarium's uh, example of a kelp forest when we first started our program here. That was Blue Cavern, an example of a kelp forest uh, that we have here in Southern California. Now in Southern California around Long Beach, we don't have Southern sea otters like this. Um, we have spotted it and then it moved back north again, <laughs> but uh, they don't really reside here. They don't live here. But this is what a kelp forest might look like. Lots and lots of seaweed. And this seaweed that you see here, this kind right here, is kelp. And there is so much of it sometimes that it is so thick, it really creates a forest of seaweed underwater. And that's why it's called a kelp forest. Now, sea otters really thrive in these habitats. Like I said, their adaptations really match well to this sort of place. Why do they live in kelp forests? Well, one of the main reasons is that there um, typically is a lot of great food in a kelp forest like this. If you think about a food chain, most food chains towards the surface of the ocean really originate with um, producers, right? Producers are on land plants. Also in the ocean, there are some plants too, but more abundant in the ocean are algae. And there are a lot of algae in a kelp forest. All right, so there's tons of algae here, and that's kind of the basis of this food chain. The bright sunlight, the really thick algae, and a, a balanced ecosystem basically means there's going to be tons of different animals. The biodiversity is going to be amazing. Many different kinds of fish, but not just fish, also invertebrates, the animals that don't have backbones. And what I'm talking about are things like clams, Okay, those two-shelled animals, there's going to be mussels that are very similar to clams in, in um, general function or general shape, right? The two-shelled animals. Crabs, sea stars, sea urchins, those pokey balls um, that are actually animals, but they look like spiky craziness. Um, so, oh, there they are. Hey, sea urchin. So all of these animals are going to be very abundant in a kelp forest. You're going to find a lot of them. And these are the kinds of things that uh, sea otters eat. Now, there has to be a lot of food available to them because sea otters eat a lot of food. It is estimated that they can eat up to about 25% of their body weight a day. Now, if you can do this math, just imagine, think about how much you weigh, divide it by four, and that is 25% of your body weight. So if you weighed 100 pounds, you would be eating about 25 pounds a day. 25 pounds of food. It is a lot of food. Now, they don't do that every single day. Um, sometimes they'll eat just a little bit less. It depends on how much they really need to function. Now, we need to eat more when we're really active, right? And that's the same thing for otters, too. When they're really active, which they tend to be fairly active, they do have to eat a lot. And here is an otter eating. Now, do you notice what it's eating? Is it easy to see? Actually, this little 
that little uh, leftover <laughs> makes it easy maybe to tell. These are shrimp. And if you notice, they actually do shell the shrimp. Sh uh, the shells of the shrimp aren't their favorite part. They really want the meaty part. It's kind of like people. Um, but there are some sea otters that will even save the shells for a little snacky snack later. Uh, so um, they're going to be eating a lot of food. And this fuels them for, for the energy they need to do the hunting, to get away from predators, um, and, and those sorts of things. The other thing that they're using this energy for is to keep them warm. So remember we said that they live in the cool waters of uh, central California all the way north up into Alaska. So the water is much, much cooler uh, than, say, a nice warm tropical area like Hawaii. So they need to stay warm. And by eating a lot of food, it's basically fueling their metabolism to create heat so they can stay warm. So they need to eat a lot to fuel that metabolism. Their metabolism is basically how quickly they can digest and use up their food. So they have a very, very high metabolism. That's also why they need to eat a lot. It's all connected. Now, another thing that's going to help keep them warm is that fur, okay? So we know that they eat a lot to, to stay warm, but they also have really thick fur to stay warm. If you take a look at this otter, you can see a lot of fur, a lot of eating too, but a lot of fur. You can't really see their skin. The skin you see is really their noses and their paws, Okay, so that's really the only exposed skin that they have. Other than that, they are completely covered in fur. And uh, that fur is really great because it's so thick, it's actually blocking out water. When the otters are in the water completely soaked, at least that's what it looks like to us, it's really just the outside fur that's wet. Inside, the fur is dry and their skin is dry. So it's pretty crazy. The fur is so thick, it blocks water from getting to their skin. And then their um, metabolism, right? That food that they eat that kind of creates heat is warming up the air close to their skin to keep them warm. It's kind of like when you wrap a blanket around you and you have air there. When you first put the blanket around you, it's still a little bit cold, right? After some time, your body warms up the air underneath the blanket and then you feel nice and cozy. That's basically how an otter's fur works. Otter fur is so thick, if you make an OK sign, that O is about an inch squared, it can be up to one million hairs. Now, it's a lot of hair, right? One million hairs. Well, just for comparison, uh, a large dog has about a million hairs on its whole body. Not just this much face, but the whole body people don't have nearly that many. In fact, you'd have to have probably seven to 10 um, heads of people to make one million hairs. It's wild. Now, I do have a, a document camera, a camera that we can kind of get a close look at some, um, some different artifacts. And I wanted to see if we can take a look at some otter fur so you can see what it looks like um, up close. All right, so I'm gonna head over to my document camera and I'm going to put some fur down here for us to look at. So right now it's a little bit tough to see. Let me see if I can turn some light on and zoom in. All right, there we go. So it is incredibly thick, right? Let's make it brighter. Ooh. And it's also fairly dark. Now, uh, this is so thick that if I split the fur here, you can see like we still just see fur, okay? So they have a ton of fur. Now the surface of it is what's going to be getting uh, wet, right? So the surface fur, the, that's the part that we really see. That's the part that gets wet when they're in the water, which really sea otters live in the water. They can go on land, they can move on land, but they tend to live their whole lives basically in the water. And then you can see here, it's a little bit lighter colored. It's a little bit fluffier and finer looking. That's the part that's really there and designed to keep them warm. So nice and thick fur. Okay, so now we know how they stay so warm 
even when they're diving and swimming underwater. Now, what's also kind of interesting is since we know that there is air trapped in that fur, when they dive underwater and swim completely submerged underwater, you'll notice that there are bubbles. Look at that. There are bubbles that come up from their, um, their bodies. They, uh, they have those bubbles because air likes to float. And so some of the air does escape. That's another really good reason for them to come back up to the surface of the water um, because then they're back up in the air. They can floof up their fur a little bit and then their bodies again will warm that air to make sure that they stay nice and warm. Now we have a few questions here. Why do otters have gray hair? Well, that gray silvery hair that they have on their heads, that shows maturity. Now, not all otters get that gray silvery. Some of them stay pretty dark, but typically speaking, most otters, um, when they are born, they're a dark brown. And as they age and mature, the top of their heads or kind of their heads and their faces and maybe even into their shoulders tends to kind of lighten up and they get a more silvery appearance. So that does kind of show us a little bit about their age. Now here is a younger one. You can see how dark this otter is. The whole body is a very, very dark brown. Now again, not all otters are going to be real silvery. Some of them are going to be somewhere in between. So it really depends on the otter, just like people, right? <laughs> all right, Tegan asked, can sea otter babies swim when they're first born? Now, this is so interesting. Um, we did say that they're born. We're talking about young otters here and they are born in water. Now, what's so interesting is that they're quite buoyant. What that means is they're very floaty. Um, they don't exactly know how to swim first off. In fact, they kind of have to learn how swimming goes. And that's one reason why they need to stay with their moms. They need to learn how to be an otter. They need to learn how to survive in their habitat from their moms. And so when they're first born, they're just really good at floating. And, and that's because I think their fur is just so good. All of that air in there is almost like having a, a balloon that you were born with. Um, but mama really does take care of that baby in the beginning until it's able to float really well on its own. All right, Xavier from Hawthorne is asking, what do sea otters sound like? Oh boy. <laughs> Otters have a lot of different sounds that they can use. Um, they tend to be fairly high pitched. And we, I believe, do not have any sounds of otters um, to, to share with you today, but um, they can make a lot of sounds. If they're really upset, they might even hiss, but typically it's a very high pitched squeak or squeal even a scream sometimes. And so we do hear our otters do that on occasion, especially when you're in the exhibit with them um, or when the aquarium is very, very quiet, especially when they're playing and chasing each other around. Uh, where did the fur come from? Um, the, oh, the, the pelt that we have, um, it was part of an otter. That otter is uh, no longer alive. This is not something that we actually own. It is on loan uh, to us here, so that way we can share it with people to help people learn about sea otters. So thank you for that question. Um, let's see, we also have Adam and Hawthorne asking, uh, how do they eat urchins? Great question, Adam. All right, let's see if we can, uh, Take a look at them eating there. Okay, so while you look at them eating, one thing you may notice is that they do have some pretty significant teeth. And those significant teeth are really helpful when it comes to eating urchins. In fact, I even have a skull with me. So we can go over to my document camera, just like we did with the fur, and take a look at a skull. Now this skull is a model, so it is not a, it's not a real one made of plastic, but it's a really good representation of what they look like. So let me bring that lighting down. Okay, that's much better. Okay, so this is the side view of the skull here. You can see this is the brain case. So this is where their brain would be. Right here is where their eye would be. And right here is where their noses would be. So they have fairly significant sized noses, right? We can see that from the pictures and the videos that we've been seeing. Now take a look at those teeth. These teeth are impressive. These are not teeth of a plant eater. These are definitely teeth of a carnivore. 
Now, when they eat urchins, first they have to be able to pluck them off the ocean floor. Urchins have a fairly good uh, feet called tube feet that allow them to really stick to surfaces. So these uh, otters have to be pretty clever in order to first even get them off of the ocean floor. And what they do is they use tools. There are not very many animals that use tools um, outside of primates, but otters do. They actually use rocks as their tools. So they can use a rock to help pry the urchin off of the sea floor. Then when they're floating on their backs, they can use this crazy bottom tooth here. And if you look at a sea urchin, those spines on the top. So, okay, let me, let me tell you what's happening here. These long skinny things that are sticking up real high with a little thing on the end, that's a foot. Okay, so their feet can reach pretty far. The um, pokey bits. The spines are about right here for this purple sea urchin. So they're still pretty long, but if you look underneath, those spines are much shorter. So urchin spines on the bottom are short. So it's easier for the, um, the otter to get a tooth in there without it poking them and just enough so it can crack it open. Now urchins have this kind of hard um, shell-like thing. It's called an urchin test just under all the spines. In fact, all the little bumps that you see here that has the spines on them. And so, uh, so this is a fairly thin, fragile urchin test. So all, of, all the otter needs to do is really get a tooth in here to get it to crack. And once it cracks, it's fairly fragile and easy to break open. And what they wanna eat is just on the inside. All right, so that is how they eat urchins. Now again, they do eat a lot of food and urchins are not the only things they eat. They'll eat clams, eat crabs. We saw it eating shrimp. Um, they'll occasionally eat fish. They don't tend to go after the really fast swimming fish, but the, if they happen to catch them, they'll eat them. But again, here's the crab. Um, and really that tool, the rock is going to be most helpful. Now, when they do this, remember they're going to the ocean floor. And if they have to go to the ocean floor to collect food, then come up and eat it and go back and forth. They're actually using a lot of energy to even collect their food. Luckily, they actually have built-in pockets. Did you know that otters had pockets? Not like a kangaroo pocket, okay? Um, instead, they have just like a lot of skin uh, right by their arms and their body. And that skin is almost like a pocket. So when they dive in the water and they see a lot of food they want, they can shove stuff in their pockets. They can even save their tool and tuck it in their pocket. Then go up to the surface, float on their back, pull food out of their pockets to eat. All right, so that's one of the ways that they can actually collect food. Now, some things they eat are really tough to get off of a rock. We were saying that urchins can be tough, that they're really good at sticking. Something that's even better at sticking is an abalone. An abalone is a snail that has a really big foot that's like a giant suction cup and a shell that goes over it. Now, abalone have a lot of, uh, a lot of meat in it for, um, for otters. In fact, there have been studies done that show that otters who eat abalones tend to be bigger and healthier than otters that don't. Now, it's tough to get an abalone because they're so good at sticking to rocks. So for them, they have to use their rock tool and they often will have to go down, work to try to get the abalone off, go back to the surface and breathe, dive back down again, find that abalone and work to get it off. So it is a lot of work for our otters to get their food. Now, sometimes it's much easier to just get a mussel or a clam. And, um, and that's one of the reasons why they do tend to eat a lot of those as well. All right, Nina is asking, can sea otters bite and does it hurt? Well, uh, yes, they can. Anything with a mouth can bite and you've seen those teeth right? So we definitely, uh, they definitely can bite and it probably would hurt. However, um, we really shouldn't be that close to otters in general. Now, uh, there is a, a protection called the Marine Mammal Protection Act, that a law basically that was passed a while back that says that we really shouldn't be going close to otters. Now, more than that protecting us, it's really for the otters. Remember, they have to eat a lot to fuel the energy they need to survive. If we go up to them, that could be very scary for them. We're big, 
right? And maybe we kind of look like predators. We might be noisy and scare them. And so if they try to swim away and get away from us, they're using the energy that they should be using to hunt for food. So we definitely don't want to approach otters. Not only is it illegal, but it's actually bad for otters in the ocean if we try to approach them. So if you did ever happen to see them out in the ocean, the best thing to do is to look at them from afar, maybe even get binoculars so you can get a really close look at them. But the cool thing is these southern sea otters really do live close to us. They really only live about a mile offshore at most. They tend to be quite close, which means that we have lots of really cool opportunities to be able to see them out there in the ocean. And then, of course, you can come visit places like the Aquarium of the Pacific, who has them um, to kind of show folks so they don't have to go out in the ocean, show folks what otters are all about and help inspire them to do things to help those sea otters out in the ocean. Now, uh, sea otters, not only are they really cute and so we want them to be around, and yes, they have a ton of whiskers, which I think adds to their, their cuteness. So Mila, they do have a lot of whiskers and those whiskers are great for sensing their environment. Sometimes when they go to the ocean floor, it can be a little bit on the darker side. Maybe there's a, it's kind of like murky and it's tough to see. So those whiskers are gonna help them to sense their, um, their environment. They can see what's around just by having whiskers that touch things, which is pretty cool. But not only is, uh, do we want them around because they're super cute, but we want them around because they play a really important role to their habitat. Remember, they eat a lot of food, right? 25% of their body weight. So that also means they're going to be eating a lot of seafood, especially urchins. In fact, some sea otters eat so many of those purple urchins, their teeth turn purple. It's pretty wild. Um, but it's a really good thing because sea urchins are really pokey and there's not very many animals that have adaptations that help them to eat sea urchins. In Southern California, we have lobsters and we have sheephead, which is a pretty big fish with a really strong jaw and some pretty good teeth you have to have very special adaptations to be able to eat something so pokey. So not many things eat them, which means that a sea urchin population can really explode if the animals that eat them disappear. And that's actually what was seen with sea otters and kelp forests. Sea otters used to be hunted because their fur was so good and so warm, people were using it for things like clothing. But then we found that sea otters were, uh, were so low in population, they were almost extinct. And uh, there was a point in which we actually thought that Southern sea otters were extinct. But thankfully, they were not totally gone. There was a very small population of them and they've been able to have babies since to grow that population, which is fantastic. But when we didn't have many sea otters around, we actually noticed that kelp forests were disappearing. Those pokey sea urchins, had so many all over the ocean floor that they ate up the kelp forest. Now, sea urchins do eat kelp. The kelp is that seaweed, right? That seaweed that makes the forest of the otter habitat. And that seaweed um, is attached to the bottom of the ocean with something called a holdfast. It looks like almost like roots that are holding onto rocks. Well, sea urchins don't swim, they crawl. And so the heart on the bottom right here that attaches that kelp to the rock is the part that they can reach. So they'll eat up all this bottom. The kelp is no longer holding onto the rock and it floats away. So they can completely take down a kelp forest if there are too many of them. We need otters around. They're considered a keystone species. We need otters around to eat enough sea urchins to keep their population under control. That way, they cannot take out an entire kelp forest. If a kelp forest disappears, look at all the other animals that would disappear too. All of the animals that you see here in this kelp forest depend on these, uh, this habitat for shelter, for food, for a place for their babies to hide and grow up. So sea otters are incredibly important for the balance of ecosystems such as this. Now, what can we do to help out sea otters? There have already been laws put in place like the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. That means that they are protected. We can no longer hunt them. 
And that's a good thing for their population. Their population can go up. But if we don't hunt them anymore, but, but we still want to help them, what do we do? Well, one of the things that we can do is to help promote a healthy ocean. If we have a healthy ocean, like a, a kelp forest habitat like this, the otters have a place to live and they have plenty of food to eat. How do we have a healthy ocean? Well, there's a couple of things we can do. If any of you love to eat seafood, like a sea otter, and I like to eat seafood too, when you choose seafood or when you uh, maybe even tell the adults who do the shopping, when you eat seafood, we want to choose sustainable seafood if possible. Sustainable means that the seafood is caught in a way that doesn't hurt the habitat and doesn't hurt the overall population. So sustainable is a good thing for a balanced ocean. Now, how would you even know if it's sustainable? Number one, you can uh, see if they have a certification. So sometimes there's certification like Marine Stewardship Council that really does a lot of investigations on how things were fished. And so they might put like a stamp of approval on it that says it's sustainable. Another thing is to choose seafood from the United States because the U.S. does a pretty good job regulating fisheries um, so that we want them to, to have good practices that don't harm the ocean. So that's another good way to, um, to help make sure that your choices are sustainable. Another thing you can do is choose seafood that is a little unusual. And what I mean by unusual is that Americans, for the most part, eat a whole lot of shrimp, salmon, and tuna. And if we decide to eat something that's different than shrimp, salmon, and tuna, we are putting less pressure on the shrimp, salmon, and tuna that live in the ocean. So maybe try something like yellowtail or halibut. Those are other kinds of very tasty fish that, uh, that we can eat and that there's not as much pressure on them and maybe even others as well. Now, before we sign off, I definitely want to make sure that we answer the last few questions that have come in. Mrs. Richards, Mrs. Richardson's class in Hawthorne wants to know if otters ever go on land. Well, yes, they can, um, but they very, very rarely do. Everything that a uh, sea otter really needs is in the ocean. So they have a place to hide and live like the kelp. They have lots of food to eat in the kelp forest. Um, they have their babies in the water and everything. So they often do not come on land, but they can. And in fact, um, if I'm not sure if any of our videos that we've shown so far actually have them moving on land, but we do have them come out on land sometimes, and you can see how they move. They're pretty quick. Now those back flippers are real great for, um, for swimming because it really is like a flipper, but it's also pretty good to stand up on as well. And we have our otters here at the aquarium do that to make sure they get lots of exercise and stay nice and strong. One of the things, again, is to have them stand up on their hind legs. So, or even have them run around on land. It just helps them continue to use their muscles. So thank you, Mrs. Richardson class. We have Silas asking, do sea urchins have poison in their spines? The sea urchins that we have here off the coast um, do not have any poison or venom. So uh, that makes it a much, much easier for a sea otter to eat them, right? But there are some sea urchins in the ocean that do. So my recommendation is if you were to go to the ocean and go exploring, make sure that you don't just touch any animal that you see. You would want to make sure that you know what the animals are before you interact with them. And sometimes the best way to interact is just to take a really good look at them and observe. What do you see here? You can check out their colors, their shapes. Is any part of them moving? Where do you think they eat? Do they have eyes? Those are really great ways to explore. We have CJ asking about how otters have babies. Well, again, otters, uh, the sea otters, they have their babies in the water. So when they are floating in the water is where they can give birth. There are a lot of other otters in the world that live on land, and those are different types of river otters. They live where the fresh water is, not the salty seas. And those otters tend to give birth on land, but sea otters give birth in the water. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining me in our exploration on sea otters and learning how we can help them out there in the ocean. If you have any more questions, please feel free to email us at live at lbaop.org. This does it for our programs today, but we do have programs for the next couple of days. So hopefully you can join us on Thursday and Friday as well. Thanks again. Have a nice day.
Bye-bye.